and O Nephathus, Aphelius, fitted for son, Amen. O Master who loves mankind, illuminate our hearts with the pure light of your divine knowledge and open the eyes of our mind to understand the teachings of your holy scriptures. Install in us also the fear of your blessed commandments that we may overcome all carnal desires, entering upon a spiritual life and understanding and acting in all things according to your holy will. For you are the enlightenment of our souls and bodies, O Christ God, and to you we give glory together with your Father and your all-holy, gracious, and life-giving Spirit, both now and ever and in the ages of ages. Amen. Amen. I forgot to do any announcements last time, which makes me a week late and a dangerous week late because we have um, Dr. Tudback coming tomorrow night. If it snows excessively hard, we'll cancel. If it snows, I mean, you know, just you play it by ear. Don't go out and get yourself killed. Uh, but, you know, he's driving from Front Royal, so it's probably snowing worse there than it is here. That's one thing. You always call me on my cell phone. My number's on every flyer. Okay, you can call me anytime you want. Um, what's he talking on? Human nature. What is man? What is our soul? Why do we have a body? Uh, lots of things that we all kind of know a little bit about, but trust me, we don't know enough about it. Dr. Cutterback's class on human nature, I took at Christendom College, and uh, it was life-changing for me. So I recommend it highly, 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 much more than I do this Bible study. Well, the Bible is extremely important to read as far as Dr. Cutterback teaching, you know doesn't quite compare. So, uh, tell your friends about it. Come. I'm sorry to be announcing it so late, but again, I, what can I say? Just, I highly recommend it to everybody. Don't miss it. This unless room. you absolutely have to. Yeah, this room, and I hope you outgrow this room. That would be nice. Um, Alright, that's that, and that flyer's in the back. Um, the Catechist Resource Group is having Father McAfee speak uh, at St. Andrews. Father McAfee and Father Scalia on the liturgy. Uh, Pope Benedict XVI in the liturgy, something similar to what we talked about um, about a month ago before Christmas. Um, but I'm sure they're going to talk about things that I didn't talk about, so there you go. I recommend that too. That costs a little money and it's not here, but at the same time, Father McAfee is a great speaker and so is Father Scalia. Uh, I have your schedule there. I do not have a flyer out for you on Islam yet, but on February 17th, Dr. Marshner is coming to speak on Islam in the morning on Saturday. Again, I don't bring people here to speak with you that I don't think are great speakers. I've taken a class from him on Islam. It was excellent. Um, so I'm only going to bring you people that are very interesting and I and I won't recommend something that's, that's not really very good. So I highly recommend Dr. Markner to you also. He was my mentor in theology. Um, and then you'll also see on there the Divine Office with Father Gibbs over the next Saturday. Okay, so that's there. Um, in the back, you probably been picking up the last couple of weeks your outline of the Bible sheet. If you didn't get it, don't worry about it. You can get it when you come back. It's just very nice when you when you start to get it. It's very nice because right in the middle. You'll see a gray line. If you don't have it with you, just look at it. You can see that gray line that runs through it. Those are the historical books of the Bible that you've got to read in order to get the storyline. And then you'll see the prophets that drop out and other little stories that drop out of that that you can read as kind of further information. Okay, But if you want to read through the Bible historically, you've got to read those books. Now some of those books, some parts of those books contain things like lots of laws and stuff that you got to just slug through. But uh, anyways, this is very helpful. My brother put it together, and uh, I use it all the time. I shrunk it down and peeped it to the back of my Bible so that it's always there for me. Okay? Um, okay. Last time we ended with the book of Numbers, I just want to look at one thing real quick. Open up to Exodus chapter 40, verse 34. Chapter 40, verse 34. At the end of the book of Exodus. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I got one more announcement for you. Thank you, Edmund. And that is, that you see what these little things are? Mm -hmm. They're not microphones. They're uh, recorders. Okay? I guess recording microphones. Whatever. They're not amplifying me. They're sucking me in. That's the point. But they're sucking you in also. So it's being recorded for, for something. The reason is because we're going to be throwing these classes up on the internet for people to download if they want, if they miss a class. And that's going to be true for all of our classes that are in this room. Um, there was a nice man that donated this whole thing, and he's going to be putting it up for free on the internet for us. So, uh, uh, is it on the, on the parish yes, website? Yes, you just got recorded. Okay. So, on, on the parish website? <laughs> uh, it's not on the parish website. I'm going to give it to you as soon as it's up and running. It's close. So okay. probably by next week it'll be up and running. But that means that you're being recorded, and so if you say anything, it's there. And that also means for the last couple of classes that happened, and Edmund back there said, you better tell people about that, because that's not so nice to record them without them knowing. And I thought, oh, I hadn't really thought about that. So there you go. If you have any problem the last couple of weeks, we won't put it on the internet. You can let me know. Okay? But it's not, it's not going to be some high professional thing where it's being sold either. It's just being put up there for people's use to st further study and review. Okay? That's all. Um, Did you say great idea? Yeah. yeah. No question. Okay. No bad questions. You no, know, you can ask, and that's why I hope you don't do it, because it's not like that. It's just it's just us, and it's, these are the people that are listening to it afterwards anyway. So ask whatever questions you want. I want to do something real quick with you guys, because I realized we got into the book of Leviticus and Numbers last time, and maybe some, most of you probably know a little bit about Leviticus, a little bit about Numbers, but maybe some people don't know anything. So here's what I want to do. Open up your Bible to Genesis real quick. Genesis 1-1. One, one. Sorry, I know something else. Genesis 1 1, you can get our first, first book of the Bible, first verse. What's it say, Nora? What's it say? Just say it. You just said it. Nora, what's it say? In the beginning, Genesis. Genesis just means beginning. Okay? Okay, fine. Turn to the book of Exodus. So the book of Genesis talks about the beginning. Ah, very nice. Okay? Exodus, what's it talk about? Journey. Exit. Yeah, the exit from Egypt, right? The exit from Egypt. So we're exiting Egypt, okay, in, in that book. <coughs> Leviticus, you guys, we talked about it last time. The book of Leviticus is written for who? Levi. The Levites, right? Leviticus, the Levites. And why do the Levites need a particular book written for them? They became priests. Why? Because Aaron's <laughs> well, Aaron built the golden calf, but remember, the firstborn got involved in that firstborn cult, which wasn't so good, at the uh, golden calf incident, right? And so the book of Leviticus kind of fits into the book of Exodus right there at the golden calf incident, right? So it's the priestly book for the, for the tribe of Levi, the priests. Numbers. What does the book of Numbers talk about? No, it talks about the census. Take a census take of the whole community. Yeah, they take a census of all the people of Israel. There's going to be another census taken later on uh, that we'll look at. And the book of Deuteronomy, what does it talk about? Duo. What's the word duo mean? Two. It's the second law. First law was given in Exodus. Deuteronomy is the second law that's given. There's a reason there's a name for the second law. Just like the book of Leviticus was rather unfortunate that it had to be written, so the book of Deuteronomy is rather unfortunate in big parts of it. All right, there it is. What's that? The second law. We're going to look at it. Yeah. We haven't gotten to Deuteronomy yet. So, Numbers 19, I'm sorry, Numbers chapter 9, verse 15. Let's look at that. Numbers 9, 15. Sheila, can you read that for us? On the day that the tabernacle was set up, 
The cloud covered the tabernacle, the tent of the testimony, and then evening it was over the tabernacle like the appearance of fire until morning. So it was continually. The cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. Okay. So you see that on the day the tabernacle was set up. Do you remember where else we saw that exact same sentence? Where else? It was in Exodus. Yeah, the end of Exodus. So keep your hand there in your Bible. Keep your hand in your And flip back to Exodus chapter 40. The very end of Exodus. You guys tell me if it gets hot in here. Exodus. 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 Okay, so Exodus chapter 40, verse 34. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, and Moses time, and so on. See the same sentence there? Okay, so what you get in between there, just kind of scan with me. You get the book of Leviticus, that book of the priests, right? And then we're into the book of Numbers. Okay, now come with me to the book of Numbers. Okay, holding on to all that stuff. And right at the book at the beginning of the book of Numbers, you get the census. Okay? You could probably well you can actually read your subtitles there, it probably says it. Uh, men are men are numbered. Okay? So there you go. There's your census. In between the census and chapter 9, verse 15, where we talk about that glory cloud coming down again, right? You get that whole return I was talking about to the time when the Levites were called. Okay? So it's reflection in the text. The time when the Levites were called. Back at Mount Sinai. Okay? And so, and, and the golden calf incident. So you get a, right there in, in between chapter 3 of Numbers and chapter 9 of Numbers is this reflection that takes place about the Levites. Does that make sense? Okay. Fine. So in chapter 15, we're back, in a sense, to the beginning of the book of Exodus. And when that glory cloud comes down and the tabernacle is set up, we're ready to take off from Mount Sinai towards what place? Canaan. Yeah, the promised land. It's not too far of a journey. So we're now we're at Numbers chapter 9 and chapter 10. You're looking at those pages. Okay? Look at chapter 10, verse 11. So they were at Sinai for a year? Yes. A year plus a few days. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, actually, no, it's less than a year because, if, I mean, technically, if when you started the year back in Passover, Egypt, right? To the end of Exodus is a year. Exactly. So basically, they're at Sinai for 11 and a half months. Something like that. All yeah. right. Well, no. No, that's what he told us last week. We can talk about that later. There's a little stuff come up to me later. We'll talk about it. Okay? <laughs> then who sees that? Um... Chapter 10, verse 11, Sheila. Chapter 10, verse 11. In the second year, in the second month, on the 20th day of the month, the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle of the testimony, and the people of Israel set out by stages from the wilderness of Sinai, and the cloud settled down in the wilderness of Paran. They set out for the first time at the command of the Lord by Moses. Okay, fine. So they take off. The next couple of chapters there is just simply the story of them making their way to the Holy Land. It's not a very far trip from Sinai to the edge of the Holy Land. Okay, it doesn't take them very long to get there. There's a few stories about how they complain and whatever. They hate the food that God gave them, the manna and whatnot. Kind of fun stories in there about that stuff. And finally in chapter 13, we get to the Holy Land. We looked at that at the end last time. Okay? And chapter 13, verse 1, And the Lord said to Moses, Go ahead, Sheila. Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I give to the people of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers shall you send a man, every one a leader among them. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran, according to the command of the Lord, all of them men who were heads of the people of Israel. And these were their names. Okay, and so on. Um... There were two important people in that company. There were 12 men sent, one from each tribe. And two important people in that company were who? Caleb and Joshua. Yeah, Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb. You guys remember Joshua's name. Well, here he is again. And we have Hosea. Hosea. If you're using a new American. Yeah, that's fine. 
Okay. Native New American. But, um, yeah. Hosea, Joshua, Jesus, all the same name in Hebrew. Okay. What's that? We're in chapter 13. Thank you. Yeah. Joshua is my, 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 my little friend. Really? That's very nice. <laughs> okay, back to my um, That's been borderline. <laughs> <laughs> Chapter 13, verse 21. So they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin. And they go into the Holy Land, right? And they, he says, bring some of the fruit of the land. And they come back with these huge grapes. We'll talk about that some other time. And some figs and all this fruit. And they saw some of the guys from a distance in the land and they come back to Moses and the rest of the camp and what do they say? You help me. What did they say? We can't attack. What's that? They're too big for us. Yeah, he says, they said the men in, the, in, the, uh, in that place are giants and they will kill us. Okay? And what did Joshua and Caleb say? Joshua and Caleb say, uh-uh. Right, we can go in because the Lord is with us. Yeah, the Lord is with us. We can do anything. We can conquer anyone. Okay? The Lord is with us. Now, remind me, why is it that God is going to have them go in there and take somebody else's land that doesn't seem very just to me? Because they're the, they're not, the residents now are not the proper tenants. Right, they're supposed to be the slaves of Shem. Right. Right. Not right. We, you remember we followed this line of the people of God who were dwellers of that holy land. It was the holy land of God, the dwelling place of God, and God's people were to dwell there. You remember that. So we followed that line all the way through these men, all the way through Jacob and Judah and and Judah's brothers, remember Judah has 12 <coughs> brothers, right? And Judah is the one that receives the blessing. Okay? Why, why was it that they ever left that land in the first place? The Holy Land. Remember, Abraham was called there and given that land. Why did they ever leave? Starving. What's that? They were starving. Well, Abraham, yeah, well, what partially, Abraham yes, there was a famine in the land, right? Why else? Why did God allow the chosen people to be taken to Egypt in the first place? Or why did he allow them to go to Egypt in the first place? Well, then it was because he withdrew his blessing because Joseph was sold into slavery by his and brothers. Abraham also sinned and took the slave lady. And well, there's that aspect, but that kind of plays out in the whole circumcision thing a little earlier. But this particular incident, Joseph is sold into slavery by his brothers, and so what happens... You know, your sins oftentimes follow, or your, your, what happens in your life follows upon the sins that you commit. Okay, oftentimes. And so, ends up, their brothers, the brothers all get taken into Egypt, and their sons end up in slavery. Okay? Um, so, fine, they're coming back now. They're given this land which was rightfully theirs in the first place. And they're going to go into their home, and they're going to take it. And if people raise a sword against them, just as I said last time, if somebody raised a sword against me in my own home, I have the just right, in fact, I have the duty as a father to my family to kill them on the spot. Okay? They are endangering our lives as a family unjustly. Okay? Yeah. So the other explanation I heard of this, um, the reason that the Israelites had to conquer the people of Canaan was because of the evil that they encountered. Well, that's true. In the, in that in a sense, that's just not you can see. But yeah, that's probably the reason why they had to do what they had to do. In fact, slaying these people, man, woman, and child. Why? Because the people, in a sense, were so caught up in their in their um, in their paganism and their sin, and their you know worshiping of Baal, and their sacrificing of children and whatnot. They were so blinded to the work of God. That what else, in a sense, what other choice did God have to save mankind? Okay? And that's where I was talking about salvation history is that bloody battle between God and the devil. It is a bloody battle because God wants to save us so bad and there's people that are going to fall pre as, a, you know, as a result of this battle. There's going to be people dying. Okay? And sin oftentimes blinds us. Look, when the walls of Jericho fell down, if you or I were there, right, all of a sudden the walls of the city crumble, 
If I, you know, wouldn't you go like this? I convert, <laughs> right? But they didn't, okay? And so they have to go in and deal with these people on the level that they're, they're at. And the fact is they're on the level of the sword, okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Um, chapter 14 uh, of Numbers. So why wouldn't this apply today? Well, you do the best you can in this situation. I'm saying that even today, sometimes the sword is required. Sometimes. Okay? In justice, the man stand in my house. The sword is required. Okay? Or the, there's a reason why I have a gun in my house, and I'm a gun owner because I have a gun in my family. I mean, on the level people are choosing to you know, you have to change the heart, but right. But this, this, they use the sword rather than the heart. Well, I'm saying they didn't go in first with the sword. Okay, they, these people had a chance to say, "We see the work of Yahweh, and we accept Him." In fact, we're going to see somebody who does exactly that in a minute. Okay, so, um, I'm sorry, chapter 13, verse 25, verse 25. Okay, at the end of 40 days, they returned from spying out the land. And all the congregation of the people of Israel, the wilderness of the and so on. And so they came back in chapter 14, or no, chapter 13, verse 31. Then the men who had gone up with them said, We are not able to go up against these people, for they are so strong than we, so much stronger than we. So they brought the people of Israel an evil report of the land which they had spied out. Okay? And Caleb and Joshua respond in verse 6 of chapter 14. Chapter 14, verse 6. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of uh, Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, rent their clothes and said, All the congregation of the people of Israel, the land which we pass through to spy it out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land, and so on. Okay? And they reject the, they reject the plan. And so, what's the result of it? What happens? 40, long, 40 years wandering. They end up in the, wandering in the desert for 40 years. Why 40 years? So that all the men who didn't, uh, people, all the people who, who turned against the Lord would be dead. All right, there's something a little more than that. I mean, you're right, but there's something a little more. Look at verse uh, 30, chapter 14, already. verse 30. Yes. Yes. Go ahead, go ahead and read this verse 30. Uh, and so on. Chapter 14, verse 30. Okay, no one shall no one shall come into the land where I where I swore that I would make you dwell, except Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. But your little ones who you said would become prey, I will bring them, and they shall know the land which you have despised. But as for you, your dead bodies shall fall in this wilderness, and your children shall be shepherds in the wilderness forty years, and shall suffer for your faith for your faithlessness. Until the last of your dead bodies lie in the wilderness, according to the number of days in which you spied out the land, 40 days for every day of a year, you shall bear your iniquities 40 years. Okay? Pretty hard for. Yeah. So, scan with me real quick. From, from chapter 14, okay? Just go ahead and flip the page, and you see your subtitles. Laws concerning offerings. Korah's rebellion. There's another story. The rebels punished. The priest's portion, and so on. Verse chapter 17 and chapter 18, okay? For a few chapters, all the way up until chapter 22, okay? They are wandering for 40 years in the wilderness. If you want to know what they did for 40 years, you only got a couple of chapters to find out. Okay, from chapter 14 to chapter 22. They're simply wandering in the wilderness. Okay, meeting different people, killing different people, having wars, having, you know, murmuring against Moses. Yeah. Why wasn't Moses allowed to go into the land? I would, I mean, if Joshua and Caleb were allowed to. We're going to find out about that in a minute. Okay. Um, 
Chapter 22, verse 1. Bill, you want to read that for us? Chapter 22, verse 1. Then the people of Israel set out and encamped in the plains of Moab beyond the Jordan at Jericho. Okay. You guys remember Jericho. Finally, Jericho comes into the picture because what's going to happen? They're going to come in. The first place they're going to take is Jericho. So they encamp in the plains of Moab across the Jordan from Jericho. In the plains of Moab. Turn to chapter 25, verse 1 through 9. The intervening chapters there are just about their time dwelling in Moab. Okay, wait, waiting to enter into the Holy Land. You can imagine it, you guys. They're in the plains of Moab. Okay, plains, flat. Okay? Across the Jordan from Jericho. They could literally see the Holy Land before them. And they're encamped. Thousands and thousands and thousands of Israelites are encamped across the Jordan. Okay? So you gotta imagine the tension. They want to go over and take the Holy Land. The people in the land are freaking out. You can read all the stories about them up on the mountains, you know, on the hills over the Jordan River on the other side, looking out and seeing these people. Massive number of people. They're going, uh-oh. These guys are going to come and take us. And they hear about, they've heard about, they're wandering for 40 years in the wilderness as they beat, you know, group after group after group after group, and finally they come and they camp across from Jericho. Yeah. Just sorry for the diversion, but at this time, through the wandering, are they receiving manna every day? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Annie, did you have a question? No. Yep. Uh, somebody else? No. Okay. Uh, chapter 25, verse. One. Okay, Bill, go ahead. Chapter 25, verse 1. While Israel dwelt in Shittim, the people began to play the harlot with the daughters of Moab. Okay. Shittim is an area that they were encamped in in the plains of Moab. Okay. And they began to play the harlot with the daughters of Moab. That's kind of a funny way to say it, a harlot with the daughters. Okay. What are they talking about? Illicit relations. Yeah. Oh, okay, alright. Why would they be called the harlot? Why would Israel be called harlot? No. No. Okay, why would it be up to them to behave properly? Exactly. They, because they were blessed by God. They had made a covenant with Yahweh. And we talked about a covenant in the beginning. A covenant is the joining of two parties as one. Two become one flesh. Okay? The covenant between God and His people is often spoken in the Bible as a marriage covenant, in terms of a marriage covenant. And so they're called the harlot. Why? Because they've left their husband, God, okay, as a people. And they've gone and played, right, with the daughters of Moab. Translate, the men are going and taking the daughters of Moab, okay? Keep reading for us, Bill. These start verse 1 again and read that. While Israel dwelt in Shittim, the people began to play the harlot with the daughters of Moab. These invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. Bad idea. So Israel yoked himself to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Baal of Peor is the god they're worshiping. So they start, I mean, they're in, bad, in a bad way, okay? And they're just about, this is, now look, this is 40 years after wandering the desert. Yeah, you want to go, are you serious? You're so close, don't do it again. All right, all right, keep going, Bill. And the Lord said to Moses, take all the chiefs of the people and hang them in the sun before the Lord, that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. And Moses said to the judges of Israel, Every one of you slay his men who have yoked themselves to Baal of Peor. Okay. And while this is all going on, this situation where, where justice is going to be had against these men that are doing this, okay, uh, while this is all going on and the, Moses is speaking to the people, look at what happens next. And behold, one of the people of Israel came and brought a Midianite woman to his family in the sight of Moses and in the sight of the whole congregation of the people of Israel, while they were weeping at the door of the tent of meeting. When Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose and left the congregation and took a spear in his hand and went after the man of Israel into the inner room. Okay, stop. So what's going on? He takes a woman of Midian 
and in front of all the people. You can probably figure out probably what he's going to do, right? In front of his family, in front of everyone, okay? And so he takes her going into the inner room, okay? You can imagine what's taking place. Go ahead. And pierced both of them, the man of Israel and the woman, through her body. Okay. Thus the plague was stayed from the people of Israel. Okay, so they're doing what they should not be doing. And he takes a spear and just right through both of them. Okay? Now, go ahead and read the next sentence. Nevertheless, those that died by the plague were 24,000. Wow. So you can imagine, in this almost like in a split moment, God says, hang the men. Moses turns and says, go out and slay the men that have done this. Suddenly a plague breaks forth on the people. Okay, In the midst of this man coming in, Phineas goes and, and has ju- justice on this guy. right? And 24,000 people are dead. And you can imagine the, in, the intensity of it. And, I mean, you imagine 24,000 people dead all of a sudden from a plague. Okay? So what do they do next? What happens next? Ver- chapter 26, verse 1. Go ahead, Bill. After the plague, the Lord said to Moses and to Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, Take a census of all the congregation of the people of Israel, from 20 years old and upward, by their fathers' houses, all in Israel who are able to go forth to war. Why do you think they took a census at that point? They wanted to know how many people would be going into the promised land, what the strength of the armies would be, and how many people were going in. Yeah, that's true. That is that is one reason. Why else? Why else would they need a new census taken? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Suddenly, you have a massive number of men that have got hit by the plague, okay? And they need to know who's in the camp, okay? And so through chapter 26, you see in your, your, ta- your subtitles there, probably say the people are numbered, okay? And they go through each of the tribes and they tell who's in the tribes, okay? So again, just like the genealogies, when, the, when you get to these lists of people's names, don't just flip by and say, why? Why is the census being taken here? Why is a genealogy being told? We're going to look at a genealogy in a few minutes. It's extremely important and very short. But if it were skipped, again, we would lose our storyline. Okay? I just, um, in one translation, I called it a slaughter and not a plague. Okay. Is that, is that what happened? Was it like they went out? Yeah, I don't know. I, I'd have to go and, and consult, okay. you know, I was just something confused. Hebrew, Aramaic, which I don't know. So <laughs> I'll be talking to my brother about that and find out. Okay, it's it probably. I mean, that's actually another point. that's very important when you're studying the Bible. You got to have a few translations out in front of you because you run into a situation like that. What, what the are you using New American? Yeah. 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 What, what the her her translation's a little bit different. Okay, it says the men were slain. So, um, oftentimes when you run into a situation like that, either one of the texts is taking some freedom in their interpretation, or the Hebrew word is difficult to translate. Okay, and that's where it's important that you don't just trust a translator. You trust the tradition of the church, and also you can trust yourself in reading the text in its context. Okay? Um, Fine. They take the census, and in chapter 27, chapter 27, verse 12. Go ahead, Bill. The Lord said to Moses, go up into this mountain of Ab- Abarim. Abarim is probably, Abarim. I didn't have a chance to look up, but it's probably one of the mountains on the edges of the plains of Moab. Okay, right within view of the Holy Land. Go ahead. Go up into this mountain of Abarim and see the land which I have given to the people of Israel. And when you have seen it, you also shall be gathered to your people, as your brother Aaron was gathered. Because you rebelled against my word in the wilderness of Zin during the strife of the congregation to sanctify me at the waters before their eyes. Okay, there's your there's your reason. Bill was in. You were asking that. Yeah. Okay. So what happened? Well, just real quick. We're not going to talk about it too much, but real quick. The sec- there was two times when Moses drew water from the rock. The first time God said, "Strike the rock." Mm-hmm. Okay, and water flowed forth. Okay. The second time, God said, go to the rock and speak to it and tell it to give water for it. And Moses takes his staff in front of the people and he strikes the rock again. And water flows forth. 
Okay? The tradition is that it was that particular act, not listening to God's own and not trusting in God that he could simply speak, right? Because he had his staff that had done so many things for him, right? And he goes, so not trusting in God and therefore... Okay. Um, was there a place where he got mad at the people and started you know, being abusive in language and that's why you didn't show my glory, God was saying? Did he mean that? No, I don't think so. Yeah, you could look up and maybe days, okay? All right. Um, so, keep reading it on. Uh, verse 18, chapter 27, verse 18. Verse 18. And the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hand upon him. Cause him to stand before Eleazar the priest and all the congregation, and you shall commission him in their sight. You shall invest him with some of your authority, that all the congregation of the people of Israel may obey. And he shall stand before Eleazar the priest, who shall inquire for him by the judgment of the Urim before the Lord. At his word they shall go out, and at his word they shall come in, both he and all the people of Israel with him, the whole congregation. Okay, now, in the book of Numbers, we hit at this point, we've gone through a couple of the stories, we hit another difficult text that oftentimes throws people for a loop, and that is Moses goes on a rant here, okay, if you will, about some more laws that are to be followed. Okay? In a, sense, in a sense, a second law is given. Now you're saying, but we're not in the book of Deuteronomy. You're right. Because in the book of Numbers, we're getting the story, okay? And in a sense, a, a highlight version of what the book of Deuteronomy is written for. Okay? It hits some of the main laws that are given as a result of what? Look, when you're at home with your children and they do something wrong, what do you do? Okay, you might, whatever you do, you scold them, spank them, stand in the room, whatever. And if you're in high school and they don't come home, and you, what do you say? Be home at 9 o'clock, right? They don't come home. What happens next week? Yeah, they don't go out, right? And furthermore, no keys for the car, right? All of a sudden you start making more laws, more rules for them. God is our Father, and He's talking to His children. His children have just done a terrible thing, and that is yoked themselves to Baal of Peor, right? Uh, played the harlot with the daughters of Moab. And as a result of that, you get a second law given. And in that second law, there are things like allowance for divorce. And a lot of things that have to do with relationships between men and women. Okay? In a sense, God is trying to patch the situation. Okay, to make it work. Okay, and so you get the second law given in the book of Numbers and in the book of Deuteronomy. All right, uh, so if you just scan with me the book of Numbers, and you probably again have, have subtitles, you can just look at your things offerings at the point of feast, offerings at the point of feast, keep going, vengeance of Midian, divisions of the booty, um, and so on. Okay, you get, you get a few more other stories there. At the very end of Numbers, laws concerning inheritance. Okay, you got a few stories about a couple of the, uh, the families going out and taking a particular land. And then you're to the end of the book of Numbers. Okay? Numbers wasn't that hard. A couple of confusing things. We got one more difficult book to go through. And we have dealt with Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That brick wall that everyone hits and can't get through it. Okay? But if we're patient, we'll be able to get through it. Bill, go ahead. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 1. Which chapter? Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 1. Chapter 1, verse 1. These are the words that Moses spoke to all Israel beyond the Jordan in the wilderness, in the Arabah over the Suf, between Paran and Tophel, Laban, Hezeroth, and Dizahab. Okay. <laughs> verse 2. It is 11 days' journey from Horeb, which is actually Mount Sinai, by way of Seir to Kadesh Barnea, okay, which Kadesh Barnea is close by to, to Jericho. So look, they spent 40 years going when it would have taken 11 days. Bad. Yeah, they're not moving too fast. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, verse 5, Bill. Beyond the Jordan in the land of Moab, Moses undertook to explain this law, saying, 
The Lord our God said to us in Horeb, you okay. have stayed long enough at this mountain. Okay, fine. So, right there, in the again, in the plains of Moab, right where this whole thing took place with Baal of Peor, Moses says, fine, this all has happened. I'm going to go ahead and explain the law. In a sense, give you another law, a second law on top of the first law. Okay? And the book of Deuteronomy has a lot to do with that. Um, um, it, it's got some stories in there. It starts out in chapters 1 through 5, kind of re recalling for Israel what God did for them during their 40 years in the wilderness. Okay? Look at chapter 4, or chapter 5. Chapter 5. Look at your subheading, your subtitle. What does it say? Deuteronomy chapter 5. What's, this, what's your subheading? What's that? It says the covenant of Horeb. Okay, the covenant of Horeb is simply the covenant that Moses made with the people. Okay? Then when you start reading it, it's the Ten Commandments. Okay? So you recall the Ten Commandments for them. And keep scanning the, the, um, the chapters there. You'll see chapter after chapter are instructions, laws given to the people of Israel about all sorts of things. The warning against idolatry, the year of release, administration of justice, appointed feasts, cities of refuge, laws concerning wars, various laws. I mean, when you get a subtitle that says various laws, you can usually skip the chapter. <laughs> Uh, laws concerning chastity, uh, duty of brother's widow. You see some of them having to do with that relationship between man and a woman, okay? All right, fine. All the way to chapter 27 of Deuteronomy. And finally the story picks up again. So that was your second law given. Chapter 27. Now Moses and the elders of Israel commanded the people, saying, Keep all the commandments which I have commanded you this day. Okay? Verse, and verse 3. And you shall write upon them all the words of this law when you pass over to enter the land, in the land which the Lord your God gives you, and a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised to you. Okay, now. So he takes them there and he says, He says to them, When you cross over, go up, you'll find two mountains. I want you to go up. Half of the tribes of Israel, half of the 12 tribes, six tribes of Israel. Actually, I think it's five on one mountain and six on the other. No, let's see. Joseph's out. Levi's out. I think it's six and six plus Levi at the bottom. Anyways, half the tribes get on one mountain, half the tribes get on the other, and the Levites stand in between them. Okay? As they're entering into this land. This chapter, 27 and 28. Okay? And the Levites stand in between in this valley, and they yell, echoing the valley. Curses. Okay? You'll see them there in your thing. You're scanning it. You'll see, cursed if you do this. Cursed if you do this. Cursed if you do this. Okay? And after all the curses are said, then they yell out, if you follow God, you will be blessed. You will be blessed if you do this, and you'll be blessed if you do that, and you'll be blessed. You remember, we talked about blessings and curses, and life and death. That God always puts before us these two choices. Okay? And it's always in relationship when a covenant is going to be made. Okay? God is going to make another covenant with the people now. He made a covenant at Sinai, and the people sinned when they came to the land. They refused him. And so now he says, before you, when you go into this land, another covenant is going to be made. A covenant between you and me, right? A sealing of the union. You can be brought back into my presence. Okay? Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15. Those intervening chapters are all about that. And this is this just kind of caps it, caps it for us. 30, 30, 15. Chapter 30, verse 15. Go ahead, Bill. See, I've set before you this day life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways and by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his ordinances, then you shall live and multiply, 
and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you are entering to take possession of it. Okay, and verse 19. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. When I was we were with the youth group yesterday, we were standing there at the at the uh, Supreme Court building and looking at these the military guarding us, right? Who are who are marching for life, right? Guarding us from doing anything bad, right? I told him this. I said, "Look before you. You have a choice in your life. You have a choice to live for God and therefore receive life, or live apart from God and receive death." Those are our two choices, and you will live one or the other. And it is today that you stand up for Jesus Christ, you stand up for the resurrection, and you stand up for life. Okay? It was the same story, it's the same situation given to Israel, standing there on the edge of the Jordan River, looking into the Holy Land. They had a choice to live in covenant union with their life-giving God or not. And when you're separated from Him who gives life, just like you're separated from light... You end up in darkness. You're apart from God. You end up in death. Okay? And so that is the covenant relationship that's offered to Israel at that point. And they accept it. In chapter 31, verse 9, just as a side little note. And Moses wrote this law and gave it to the priests and the sons of Levi who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord to all of the elders of Israel. Moses commanded them at the end of every seven years, at the, he says, commands them to read the law. Okay? So if anybody ever tells you that Moses didn't write the Pentateuch, there it is. Okay? Either the Bible's wrong or, well. <laughs> Turn to chapter 34, verse 5. Chapter 34, verse 5. Of course, the other thing, of course, is that Moses continues to write after his death. What's that? Moses continues to write after his death. Ah, either that or he was inspired. Yeah. No, it's possible that um, that uh, this was tapped on later on, this portion after his death. Or, you know what? It is actually possible for Moses to have been inspired to write something about his death. So, you can go either way. Verse 5. Go ahead, Sheila. Oh, I just said. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in the valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor. But no man knows the place of his burial to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. And the people of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. Then the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him. Okay. Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land which I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river. And so on. Okay. So they get the, they get the whole the holy land, and now Joshua is in charge. Moses has died. <laughs> Again, we talk about this first time by tradition. It's referenced in the in the Epistle of Jude in the New Testament. The belief among Israel was that God assumed the body of Moses, took it into heaven bodily. Okay, Moses died, and God did not allow his body to decay. Okay. Um, <laughs> Chapter 2, verse 1. Joshua chapter 2, verse 1. And we've now left the Pentateuch behind us. And we're making our way. Look at it. Unbelievable. Very. We're going to come back to this line, which we've kind of ignored for a while. There's a reason why we've ignored it for a while. Something took place in here, and that was Egypt. Okay? And you can't have leaders when you're slaves. In fact, if you're the leader, the natural born, first born, whatever, you're supposed to be the leader of a whole people, and you're in slavery, what do you do? You stand up and go, I'm the king, 
What are they going to do to you? Yeah, they're going to kill you. So we haven't heard anything about the, that holy line and Judah's line this whole time. Right? In a sense, those men have been in hiding. We're going to start to see now as they come back into the Holy Land, little glimpses as they start to reestablish themselves. And finally, they, are, they receive that, that line continues publicly again. Okay, But it's going to take a little while. Chapter 2, verse 1. And Joshua the son of Nun sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a harlot, whose name was Rahab, and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, Behold, certain men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Okay, so they go to, they go to Rahab's house. Why is Rahab even mentioned in this story? Or what does she have to do with us as Christians? She's a harlot. Well, I'm not sure what that has to do with us as Christians. What's that? She's an ancestor of Jesus. Yeah, she's an ancestor of Jesus. What? Really? Ah, and, and, the, and the genealogy of Matthew. We'll get. Don't worry. Don't turn there right now. We're gonna get to that. But Rahab, who is a, probably a Canaanite, okay, living in the Holy Land, ends up being a key ancestor to Christ. Okay. At this time, the spies come to her and she takes them into her house. Okay. And then she joins Israel because she knows what's going to happen. She's, we were talking about earlier about conversion. She converts. Okay. She sees the working of Yahweh and she changes her heart and changes her ways. Okay? The rest of them don't do that. So out of all of Jericho, one person is saved, and she ends up becoming extremely important for us today. Okay? We'll come back to her in a minute. They come into that holy land, having made a covenant with God. Turn to chapter 7, verse 1. There's all sorts of great stuff we're skipping in here. During Lent, we're going to do a three-part series, and we're going to take this whole thing we've done on a historical level, and we're going to take it up into the spiritual level, okay? The real meaning behind the text. We talked about a lot of the real meaning, but the historical level gives us that basic storyline. But throughout this whole storyline, God's working on another level in the scriptures, and we're going to go in and take a look at some of those things. Okay, to start to see the read the scriptures as they've been should be read in a historical manner, but also as the writing of God. Okay, so during that we have to do three classes on that. Um, and we're skipping all sorts of stuff right here in the text. I can't believe we have to go over it. Uh, chapter seven, verse one. But the people of Israel go ahead, Sheila. But the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things, and the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. Okay, so they go in and they take Jericho, and God says, destroy everything. You don't keep anything, because these people are worshiping idols and whatever. And this guy takes a little bit, okay? I puts it in his jacket, and what does he take? He takes an idol. Mm -hmm. Ah, bad idea, okay? And so, as they enter into the Holy Land, land having made a new covenant with God, we're suddenly given the reality that everything is not going to be just a okay. Okay, there's still going to be a problem. Okay, for the rest of the book then of Joshua, all the way up to chapter 24, you can scan with me if you want your subtitles. Okay, it's all about conquering the land up to chapter 24. Battle after battle after battle, sin after sin. They're taking the land. They keep doing the right thing and then doing the wrong thing. And then repenting and doing the right thing and doing the wrong thing. All of chapter 24, taking the land, the holy land for Israel. Okay? 17 of early yes. Said that the land was all the way to the great Euphrates River. Mm hmm. The understanding was what they took was, was miles away. Ah, this is our second problem. It's a good note. Okay? When, yeah, if we had time, when those ge ge geographic points are given, pull out your map and start reading based upon that. Because the fact is, they don't take the whole land. 
Okay? And Joshua ends up here in chapter 24, a very old man. In fact, he dies. Okay? And they still haven't taken the whole of the Holy Land. Okay? They weren't like Caleb and Joshua, trusting God. They were like the other men, a little scared to go to battle with just God on their side. Why? Because these men were huge, and there was a lot of them. And sometimes Israel, you know, the group that was going to battle was small. And probably, if you read closely, sometimes it's very small. Probably God's intentionally doing that, saying, Hey, you go take those, you know, you hundred men, go take down those thousand. Right? So they start to learn to trust God, but they wouldn't do it. And so they don't take the whole of the Holy Land. Okay? And that will be, those are the two points. Idol worship. Okay? And they're not trusting God. Okay? Through the rest of these couples, couple of books, that's the battle. And God keeps saying, go take the land. Go take the land. And they won't do it. Okay? So those are the two problems. <laughs> um, where are we? Chapter 24, verse 1. I should go back to chapter 23, verse 16. Okay, this is the end of, Moses, of Joshua's life. And what does he say to him? If you transgress the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and go and serve other gods and bow down to them, then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and you shall perish quickly from the good land which he has given to you. Okay? Chapter 23 and 24. So what's going on here? In the next chapter, at the end of Joshua, just like at the end of Deuteronomy, another covenant is made with the people. Okay? Or in a sense, the covenant is renewed. There's been a lot of sin in the the intervening uh, years. And now Joshua's old and he says, Look, you guys, before I die, better get yourselves right with God. Okay, and so chapter twenty-four is that again that cursing, that promise of blessing versus cursing. Okay, uh, verse chapter twenty-four, verse twenty-five. Chapter twenty-four, verse twenty-five. Go ahead, Bill. Twenty-four, twenty-five. Uh, actually, give us verse fourteen. Chapter twenty-four, verse fourteen. Sorry, guys. Now therefore fear the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. And if you are, uh, if you be unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve. Okay, what, and so on. And so what do they do? Verse 24. 20. Verse 24. Chapter 24, verse 24. And the people said to Joshua, The Lord our God will we serve. We will serve, and his voice we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made statutes and ordinances for them at Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God and he took a great stone and set it up there under the oak in the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said to all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness against us. For it has heard all the words of the Lord which he spoke to us. Okay, so fine. They make a covenant. They say, We are going to live according to the laws of God. Okay? Judges chapter 1, verse 1. I want you guys to see how these books oftentimes get in the way that we say, oh, the story's over. It's not over. Okay, the story continues right through the books. Okay, chapter 1, verse 1 of Judges. After the death of Joshua, the people of Israel inquired of the Lord, who shall go up for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? Okay, so this was the point we were making. Here we are, Joshua died, they still haven't taken all the land. Okay, um... That is chapter. That was Judges chapter one verse one. Okay, chapter one verse eight is very important. Take a look at that. Go ahead, Bill. And the men of Judah fought against Jerusalem and took it and smote it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. Okay, so finally, after all this time, the key mountain, the mountain where the king is supposed to dwell, the mountain where Melchizedek, Shem had dwelt. They finally come back, and finally, after Joshua's dead, they finally take Jerusalem, the center of the Holy Land, the most important mountain. Okay? But, once again, everything's not okay. Okay? (laughs) Judges chapter 2, verse 6. Okay, this again goes back and does one of these reflections upon an earlier time. It goes and talks about Joshua's death. Okay. Go ahead. Or Sheila, why don't you read that for us? When Joshua dismissed the people, the people of Israel went each to his inheritance. 
to take possession of the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work which the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years, and they buried him within the bounds of his inheritance in Timnatheres, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gaash. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, who did not know the Lord or the work which he had done for Israel. Aha! The fathers didn't teach their children. Okay? The next generation did not even know Yahweh. Okay? So I know we're a little bit over time. Give me three minutes, okay? It's worth it, trust me. We'll conclude on a fun note here. <laughs> kind of a sad note, but a fun note. Chapter 2, verse 16. Chapter 2, verse 16. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the power of those who plundered them. And yet they did not listen to their judges, for they played the harlot after other gods and bowed down to them. They soon turned aside from the way in which their fathers had walked, who had obeyed the commandments of the Lord, and they did not, and they did not do so. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judges, and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. But whenever the judge died, they turned back and behaved worse than their fathers, going after other gods, and so on. Bad idea. Okay, so the book of Judges goes through, I think it's 13 judges, okay? These men that God keeps raising up to lead Israel and to deal with their sins, okay? It's a kind of an inter, interim period between them getting their kings, okay, when King David comes, okay? And the ending of their whole Exodus situation with Moses, Joshua, they come to the Holy Land, they take it. And then you get the story of the judges, 13 judges in the book of Judges, who deal with all of these problems of Israel. The book of Judges is kind of this story that, again, is repetitive, right? They follow the judge, the judge dies, they fall into sin. Then they repent. God sends another judge, and so on like that, story after story. We're going to look at one of those stories real quick, and that will be our last thing we do today. Chapter 4, verse 17. One of my favorite stories in the whole Bible. You guys are going to think I'm terrible. <laughs> Actually, I'm sorry. We have two things real quick. Two things. Just before we look at that story, we're going to look at one other thing. I'm pretty sure I have at least 80 seconds. Okay? Keep your hand there so you don't have to find it again. And flip forward past the book of Judges to Ruth. Ruth is very short. The book of Ruth is very short. And if you have this little thing in front of you, get it later if you don't. You'll see the book of Ruth is written uh, above or below. It's written below that gray storyline. Because the book of Ruth is a little story about the time during the Judges. And you get these nice stories in the Bible. After trudging through Judges, suddenly they give you this relief of going, All right, here's a nice story about Ruth. Okay? You guys hopefully know the story of Ruth. We don't have the time to talk about it. We'll read it when we get home. You read it when you get home. It's a great story. There's lots of good stuff in there. Okay? Um, the genealogy was Babe Ruth. <laughs> Look at chapter 1, verse 1 of Ruth. So God is in Angle Stand. In the days when the judges ruled, there, there was a famine in the land. So this is taking place during the times of the judges. And a certain man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was uh, Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi. Okay, now what happens? They go into the land, and what happens? This man dies and leaves his wife alone. Not only does the man die, his two sons die. And when they went into the land, they married two women. The sons did. Okay? One of those women was Ruth. Ruth returns to the Holy Land with Naomi. Okay? And ends up marrying a certain man. Okay? Who is very important for us today. And we're going to flip to the end of the book of Ruth, which is one page. Go look at more. Okay. Chapter, thir uh, chapter, yes, chapter 4, verse 13. 
So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, right, which is the grandmother, says, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without next of kin, and may his name be renowned in Israel, and he shall be, and so and so on, okay? Verse 17. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi, right? It's really a grandson, but they're rejoicing. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Okay? Verse 18. Now these are the descendants of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron. Now, hold on. Stay with me. Why all of a sudden does this guy Perez come into the picture? He's an ancestor of Christ. He is an ancestor of Christ. Now this is where we don't want to get too confused. We're going we're gonna to pull it together. It has to do with this man right here. Okay? Now, if you want to, and I highly suggest it, go back. Oh, I wasn't supposed to have the text there. I wrote it. I typed it in today. Where is it? Here you, here's what you do. If you want, go back just prior to the selling of Joseph into slavery in the book of Genesis. Don't go there now. Okay, in the book of Genesis, just before they sell Joseph into slavery, and there's a story about Judah. Read that story. I'm going to tell you the, just the one sentence highlight of it. Judah ends up having relations with his son's daughter. Oh, on accident. Now, go back and read it. But listen, hold on, hold on, hold on. The reason that's important, the reason that's important, because, and what was her name? Do you remember? Tamar. 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 They had a son through that relationship. And his, his name was? Perez. Perez. Now look, go back to your Bible, verse 18 of, of Ruth, right there. Chapter 4, verse 18. Now these are the descendants of Perez. Now look, so Judah, Perez, and then what happens? They go into Egypt. Everything goes silent. Nobody knows who's the leader. And here it is, finally, after they've come back from Egypt. We finally get it. Now these are the descendants of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron, Hezron of Ram, Ram of Abinadab, Abinadab of Nashon, Nashon of Solomon, Solomon of Boaz, and Boaz of Obed, and Obed of Jesse, and Jesse of David, the king. So we have just followed that covenant line all the way, a little bit ahead of time, to King David. Okay? Now, well, we don't need to get there now. We'll bring in a little bit next time um, uh, where, what's her name fits into the picture? What's her name? The harlot. Rahab fits into the picture. You can look ahead if you want to go read the genealogy of Matthew. Okay, suddenly, when, not, not right now, not right now. Suddenly, when they start reading the genealogies during Christmas, you guys are going to start paying attention. <laughs> All right. Are you going to do Judges 4 7? We're going to do Judges 4 7 right now. Oh my gosh, we'll do. If you guys need to leave, it's really good. We don't want to miss it. Judges 4.17. I promise you, take two seconds. It really is. Okay? Chapter 4, verse 4. I know I said it. I know I know. Chapter 4, verse 4. Go with me real quick. Quiet. Quiet. Hold on. We're doing 30 seconds and we keep quiet. Chapter 4, verse 4. Chapter 4, verse 4. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of so-and-so, was judging Israel at the time. Okay? Now, Deborah takes one of the leaders of Israel and says to him, Go and fight against Sisera. Sisera is one of their enemies. Okay? And what happens? God is with Deborah, and so God is with Israel, and they rock Sisera. They take him out, and he did decimate his army. And verse 17... But Sisera fled on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin, the king of Hazor, and the house of Heber, the Kenite. And Jael came out to meet Sisera, Joseph's woman, at the tent. And said to him, turn aside, my lord. 
turn aside to me, have no fear. So he turned aside to her into the tent, and she covered him with a rug. And he said to her, pray, give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. So she opened a skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him. She asked him for water. He gives her milk. What happens when you drink milk? And he said to her, stand at the door, and if any man comes and asks you, is anyone here, say no. But Jael, the wife of Heber, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand and went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple till it went down into the ground. And as he was lying fast asleep from weariness. Ooh. All right, uh, I will. Uh, let's not do. Let's not do questions this time, okay? Because we're way over time. So, okay. I will stay though. If anyone wants to ask questions, let's stay. Conclude prayer real quick. Next Tuesday, same time. Bring your friends. Call the air conditioner. In the, name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Amen.